Well, hello, friends. David Vos here. Oh, my goodness. It's Christmas time. How are you guys doing today? Well, I hope you're up next to the fire and you got your stockings all on the fireplace. And I hope it's stuffed with, you know, all kinds of nuts and candy and, and everything like that. You know, because it's an important day. It's an important day that we celebrate the combination of Christ and Santa. Two completely opposite things. Um, yeah, Christ is the sun who rises in the sky and shines all the way into the west. That's the presence of the Son of Man. And, of course, Santa's down there in the winter at the bottom of the wheel, ruling on his mountain, <laughs> throwing thunderbolts down <laughs> and fire and brimstone and his judgments and his wrath. Those are his presents. I don't know where they get the idea that Santa's got presents. Maybe old Saint Nick uh, used to give the boys and girls presents. Perhaps. But, uh, you know, for me, Christmas has always been not such a great time of year. First of all, I never did like winter. I'm a I'm a spring, summer guy, you know, fall's fine. Although fall reminds me that, you know, winter's coming. But I do like the fall. But the winter, I never liked. I guess I don't like being cold. Maybe it's a little bit like old Merle, you know. If we make it through December, everything gonna be all right, I know. It's the coldest time of winter, and I shiver when I see the falling snow. But if we make it through December, oh boy, it's it's so reminiscent. Used to love that song, just made me cry. Got plans to be in a warmer town come summertime. Maybe even California. If we make it through December, we'll be fine. Yeah, oh boy, I mean, you know, him and Johnny Cash, they used to make the Christmases worthwhile. You know, and old Willie, and old Waylon. You know, old Waylon Jennings used to live. He was born, he'd be driving through uh, West Texas, somewhere near a little town called Lubbock. There's a little town called, oh, what's the name of that town? Brownwood or Brownfield or something like that. Some, Littlefield. Littlefield, Texas. That's it. Oh, boy. Big old sign. It says, this is the birthplace of Waylon Jennings. Boy. Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. You know, I love old Willie and Waylon. Hmm, don't let them pick guitars and drive mold trucks. Oh, boy, those were the good old days, you know? And now now we got, you know, rap. Oh, my goodness. And, and um, I don't know, it's just like, I, I was thinking, honestly, last night, I was sitting on the porch, my beautiful little cabin that I'm building, and it's all got glass around me, and I'm able to just see down the valley and 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 i was sitting there it was beautiful and and i was thinking about all the suffering in the world and boy howdy there's a lot a lot of suffering i don't think we understand how much suffering there is in the world i used to think there's, there's times you know, just have these little thoughts and i and i've thought this many times i thought well boy there's been a lot of suffering but you know um I suppose it's nothing in the drop of the bucket, right? Compared to the existence of mankind. I mean, you know, millions of years. And the universe has been here for billions, trillions. I mean, so it's probably always been here, right? Why would it ever just pop out of the middle of nowhere and then, boop, there's the universe, right? <laughs> Even if it took a billion years, right, from a polywog, it's still like a little boop. And um, it's like saying, okay, well, look at that baby just formed from a polywog, right? In the her mother's womb but um you know that that polywog grew in the 
Mommy's tummy came from somewhere. You know, one Christmas night, Mommy and Daddy were getting a little close behind the mistletoe, but but it came from somewhere. I mean, the universe had to come from somewhere. But I was thinking, not about that, actually. But here's this universe, and it's been here a long time, is the point. And I think it's been here forever. I don't think it's possible for something to come from nothing. Um, therefore, Genesis chapter 1 is a parable or a transmigration, a series of events uh, that describe how everything comes from the source and there's graduations. The Apostle Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 40. God gives it a body as it pleases him. There's the body of the fish, the body of the bird, the body of the mammal, the body of the man. And even so in the resurrection. So eternal progression is what I see there. I mean, there's hardly any way to get around that one. But again, back to the point. I'm looking off the porch and, and I'm thinking, okay, well, it's been pretty rough in the last hundred years. I don't think we understand the suffering it is not, I mean, imagine just one person laying on the battlefield. Maybe he's just wounded, but not completely dead. And he's just laying there and everybody, you know, he can't walk. He's got no legs, right? He's got blown up or something. And, and he's, he knows he's got to get to town or he's going to die. You know, he's got maybe 24 hours or something or, or uh, six hours. Who knows? So he's clawing his way. I mean, that's suffering. The mind is what it's going through during that particular time. Or I think about that guy that was out in the hiking or something. He got stuck between two rocks. Got his arm wedged because a rock came down, rolled and smashed his arm. And he couldn't get out. And all he had was his pocket knife. Well, we're not going to go into that one. But what, what an awful thought. That this universe could possibly allow one such one to suffer in that manner. You know, we, 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 we think about our Lord on that cross and he was being mocked and, and the thorn of a crown of thorns and the blood running down his face and the nails in his hands and, and it's just unbelievable what you know, I, I always say, you know, they say when, when it comes to the law, if we convict one person of a crime that he didn't do, it is much worse. You know, we have to err on the side of leniency. There has to be proof that somebody's done something wrong. So we convict somebody of doing something they didn't do. You know, we don't want to put anybody in jail or punish them. For something they didn't do. This is just a innocence until proven guilty. No matter what. You say, yeah, but if we convict everybody, that way we get everybody. We get all the bad guys. I'd rather let them go free than you get one person that's actually innocent and, and you convict them and punish them. You see, we know that punishment's very, 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 very bad. And, and, and even us idiots down here on this earth realize we should not ever punish anybody that's innocent. We, we avoid that. We have laws against it. You gotta have two or three witnesses. It's gotta be proof. Can't just have circumstantial evidence. Innocence is very, very beautiful thing. And we wouldn't want one little innocent puppy to be abused. Or we wouldn't want little, a uh, one little kitten to be abused. We talk about this. We think about it. We say, Oh my gosh, there's a little kitten. Oh, a little kitten along the road. I better go help him, you know. One little kitten. And the Bible says that our Father in Heaven knows when every sparrow falls to the ground. He knows. It doesn't mean, to, oh yeah, I knew that. <laughs> yeah, I don't care, but I know it. No, that's not what it's saying. I mean, obviously, the verse is saying God cares. He cares about every sparrow that falls, my friend. So why does he let them fall? God loves every one of his creatures his, his children so much he gave his only begotten son which is us that spiritual being that's within us the spark of the divine and we had to he loves us all so much he allows us to come here to learn for ourselves and eventually we end up leaving this world and that's that's a good thing 
And we've learned our lessons and we've attained unto this. We've graduated to the next place and it's, it's a, it's a painful thing, but it, it's necessary somehow, we say. That kind of thing is maybe necessary. See, a, a bird has to suffer the winters and they have to build their nests and it's still difficult and they're running around and they're doing their thing and the dogs are building their dens and birds are building their nests. But the son of man has to know where to lay his head. That's fine. The son of man can build, uh, can build a, a cabin in the woods or an igloo in the, in the snow or something. And, and the son of man can, can find somewhere to build his head. He's got arms and, you know, I, yeah, he doesn't have any, the son of man has no clothing, right? We, we're bald. <laughs> no got any hair like a bear. So we got to go find some hair, some clothing. And so we've got something else, brains. Should we have used our brains to build this government that we've got going on? Who built the government? Because that's the point. The suffering. That's what we're talking about. Thousands of years of suffering. When did, you know, I was saying, well, maybe for the last hundred years, you know, we've had World War One, World War Two, and Vietnam and Korea. And, you know, um, people in the inner cities laying around in rooms with feces all over and crack pipes and, you know, being hauled off to prison because these evil people got addicted to our drugs. <laughs> Darn it, the CIA sent the drug pens in there and they set up on every corner, lured these poor people in with no money and not a pot to piss in and said, here, have some drugs. And then when they got out of their mind stoned, they take them and haul them off to jail. What kind of a, what kind of a world is this? Seriously. All right, but that's the last hundred years. Let's just let's just skip the last hundred years. We say, well, that's an anomaly. It was just this last little throes of, you know, the evil empire took over for a short time. It was a battle, and dun, 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 dun. we won, right? We got the constitution. Everything's gonna get get better soon. All right, but let's go back before the hundred years. You know, let's go back to um, oh, throughout the steps of Afghanistan and, you know, from China all the way to Russia, across the Ural Mountains and the, uh, you know, the Mongolians, they set, they set off to, to conquer the world. What gave them the idea they needed to conquer Russia when they lived in Mongolia? Or they needed to conquer, you know, uh, Persia. When they lived in Mongolia, right? They were on horse. It was a, a few thousand people on horseback traveling from city to city, wiping out every man, woman, and child. Who gave them the idea? Oh, I remember. Remember that particular deity who came down on his mountain? And I've got to be very careful, friends, what I say. I'm not going to be using particular any particular names. Because um, I found that telling the truth is actually hate speech now. All right. Well, we'll try our best. So there was this God who lived on a mountain and uh, came down in fire and gloom and darkness. And he says, look, here's my law. I am God. There is no one else. Now, you better get that straight. Now, hey, buddy. Hey, hey oh, you over there. What are you doing picking up sticks over there? Don't you know? This is my holy day? No, 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 no. I know you think this is your day to rest. Not so. This is the day you, not, you need to get down on your knees. Get on your knees now. Don't you touch my mountain. What? Oh, you don't understand? You didn't mean to? I don't care. You were hungry? You picked up the sticks to build the fire so you could eat? I don't care. You should have done that Friday night before my Sabbath started. You see, because I got a law and it says you will... Get on your knees and bow. Okay? Now, next law. My name. Oh, oh, buddy, it's holy. Don't you ever utter my name. Don't you ever speak my name. Except to bless or to curse. Right? That's what I want you to do with my name. And then, um, you know, I want you to um, only go by my priesthood 
You're not allowed to go by anybody else's priesthood, anybody else's religion. You're going to perform ceremonies. You're, you're going to have to do what I say in every detail. The next one is that you're going to be my servants. You know, six days a week, you're going to be a slave. One day a week, you're going to come and worship before my feet. And then, of course, women, I want you to uh, sell your daughter as a slave. And if that woman ever tries to run away, because, you know, we purchase her to breed. That's what we do. And the women shall not go out free as do the other slaves. By the way, it's in a, a chapter called chapter 21, verse 7. But anyway, you know, on and on. Um, I want you to go and murder all of the nations around about. <laughs> the Hittites and the, the Zedjuzites and the Megabites and the Tittites. All these people that, that live in this area around you. I want you to take them out. I want you to murder them. Every man, woman, child, even the babies. They have donkeys and dogs and, you know, you got to kill everything and wipe everything out. Literally, burn their fields. This is genocide. And um, then I, I, I want you to understand that your children are mine. Your firstborn child is mine. Don't you ever get the idea it's not not mine. OK, now I understand you guys want to keep your children. OK, well, look, Abraham, I told him I wanted his firstborn. But uh, so here's what I'm going to do. For you guys, I'm going to I'm going to just to let you know that, I, you know, it all belongs to me. You can keep your firstborn, but you got to give me. I want you to go out in the field and get me a goat or one of your sheep or something. And you're going to bring that to me and, and I want you to kill it. Right? No particular reason. But I want you to take part of this lamb and burn it on a fire. And the smoke shall go up into the air and I'm going to smell it as a sweet smelling savor. Hoo -hoo -hoo, I'll know that you're worshiping me. Okay, this is this is what this God did. And so, you know, in, in 722 B.C., the Assyrian government came in and took them captive, which was taking everyone else captive. Now, you might you might imagine why they wanted to do that. But um, they did. And when they got to this place up there in Assyria, up by uh, Caspian Sea near, you know, that area, they sort of disappeared from history on horseback. And... The history shows, you know, we don't pay a lot of attention to these history books, but if you read them, you'll find out they became known as the Scythians, according to Josephus, people like Herodotus and these historians. And the Scythians migrated into all parts of the world on horseback, murdering and carrying out the laws of their God, committing genocide. Because that God had said, I want you to go to every four corners of the earth. This continued on for a long time. Imagine a city in Persia with walls around it. You know, the children were playing in the streets and mothers were baking their unleavened bread in their ovens. And the fathers were herding the sheep and, and hunting and so forth. And here comes a messenger running up over the wall, comes running down the cobblestone street. Everybody run, run. There's an army coming. The Mongolians are coming. The Scythians are coming. And they've murdered every town that they've entered. And we're next. Well, an hour later, they get up on the wall and they look around and they're surrounded. And the messenger speaks for the general down on the ground on horseback, hollers up and says, you will surrender. You'll give us all your women. We're, we get to take your women and all the rest of you will die. If you don't give us your women and all your gold and your horses, we're going to kill every last one of you. Well, the men of that town had a, a decision to make. 
Would they fight for their women? Well, a lot of them did make that decision. They fought bravely, but they, they failed. And this, this, you know, this happened on a regular basis throughout thousands of years. Even in a place where people lived, where there wasn't a Roman army hunting them down in the streets, uh, or wars and famines that, that naturally occur all along. Imagine, uh, we don't know exactly what life was like in the eastern steppes of the Ural Mountains or whatever, in the Mongolian plateaus and so forth. We don't know every detail, but you can imagine, just, just let's go to the year 1800 here in America. You say, well, it was a land of freedom, boy, oh, cowboys and Indians, you know, and you got your wagon and you're, you're going west and, you know, you're free, right? You get a mule and 40 acres and, you know, you're going to be a farmer and you got your shotgun on your, on your saddle and <clears throat> you got your bags of beans and you got bags of flour, lots of tobacco, jugs of whiskey. You're set. You got several mules packing your stuff and tents and axes and shovels and you're set. When you get to where you're going, you're going to build a cabin. You're going to hurt, you know, start raising some cattle or something. Well, along the way, you see some savages. Well, those are people too. Well, of course, they didn't know that. <laughs> this is savages, right? So, um, you know, perhaps they, they weren't bloodthirsty people. They were good upstanding Christians going through. And for some reason, these crazy savages come oh, whoa, 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 and surround their their um, little wagon and, and start killing them and taking all their stuff and everything. You're like, what is wrong with these people? So the word gets out that these savages are terrible. You got to kill them all. Every man, woman, and child. So this starts, of course, nobody realizes that the only reason the savages were doing that, they weren't even savages. They were actually people. They were trying to defend their land and they had already been pillaged and raped several times before from who knows, from Columbus on down, people coming in, raiding their, their, their villages and, you know, and raping their women and, and, and murdering their, their, you know, clearing them out of the land. Because remember, they killed all the buffalo. They killed all the, the natives. They, they wanted all that land because they had a plan. They had a rail car going through. They were with expansion of the colonial expansion, right? They had to get rid of all these people where they were trying to fight back just to defend themselves. Well, the average um, person in the wild, wild west going going to California to strike strike it rich with gold, they probably didn't even realize. They just knew that, the, you know, the, the story went that the natives were savages and that you had to kill them. So, of course, it wasn't so great for a lot of them, whether you were a, a pilgrim or a, a Native American. It probably wasn't good either way. You know, there was a lot of cold nights and, you know, Grandma was too old and got syphilis along the way and one of the kids broke his leg and there wasn't a hospital and his leg got gangrene. We had to bury him along the way. I mean, this was a rough life. And we're not just talking about some movie, like some <sighs> strange cinema or, you know, like you, you, it's just a, a theater or a theatrical spec. Well, this is real. These were real people. They suffered for hours out on the plains, dying, suffering, excruciating pain. There were wars every couple of years. So no matter where you ever lived in time, you either had to be in the war Sometimes that was the only way to get any money or any food because you'd already been wiped out and you had to join the army and then fight and kill your brothers and sisters or or die defending your camp or or um, the women were left behind and raped. The men were, were brutally killed in war. The, the children were taken and sex slave traffic. And, and meanwhile, there were these big castles 
that were ruling over everybody. You got these divine right of the kings, and they were seem to be instigating all of this. And of course, they were following the God that lived on the mountain. And and you say, okay, well then, yeah, it does sound like it was a little worse than what we thought. Maybe maybe a little worse than just the last hundred years. How long does this go? I mean, how far back does this suffering and this this insanity go? Well, let's see. We can go back to the Sumerians and the Babylonians, the Egyptians. I don't know. Uh, the only thing I hear about the Egyptians is just how they tried to defend themselves a couple times. I don't know that the Egyptians ever was involved in going out and murdering people and having these cam raiding campaigns of, of destruction and death. You know, when Alexander the Great went down into Egypt in 330, he leveled Heliopolis to the ground. And then he built another city, the glory, the most, one of the seven wonders of the world, you know, and he built Alexandria. And, uh, so then the Greeks went down there and they started, uh, looking into their teachings about, you know, they would entomb people and they had all of this, um, these teachings about the Ka and the Ba and the soul and where it goes. And so there was a guy named, uh, Pythagoras and, uh, down in Crete, down there in, uh, Greece. And he, you know, they had already destroyed the priesthood down there. But they allowed some of the Egyptians priests to, to, to continue on up in Alexandria because they had this great wisdom. And, and Pythagoras went down there to see what kind of wisdom they had. There were some um, early philosophers back in the days of Greece that thought they were pretty smart. Um, there was some, there's a record of some communication between the two. And, and the ancient Egyptian priests were saying, uh, you guys... <laughs> You guys think you're wise, but you know, you only know, you don't even know where you came from or who your, your people are. You don't know your history. You don't know science. You don't know about astronomy. You don't know nothing. And so Pythagoras says, well, teach me. So he went down there. They did not teach him everything. They held back a lot of it. And so Pythagoras only learned a little bit and he started a school. He was initiated into the priesthood and he started a school, but he didn't, he didn't have all of the information. And so therefore the, the Greek philosophers, their, their wisdom, um, was still hidden in a mystery. When the apostle Paul came along and the apostles and Peter and James, they said that, um, all of these mysteries, these, temples and these priesthoods was they were doing things as a shadow and a type and that there was a bigger mystery involved and they even the angels desired to peer into these mysteries but it was hidden until the appointed time and christ came in a long line of pharaohs see this is something that's been completely hidden from us there was an ancient wisdom an ancient ancient priesthood and the epitome of the two sides that battle this world out, that, that are feuding on this earth, there were two sides. There is the, the, the as above, so below, the microcosm, the macrocosm. And the place called Israel or the land of Canaan was an epitome of the, the body. You've got the brain, which is high, and then you've got the sexual organs, which is the lower part, the lustual, instinctual nature. And so in the land of Canaan, you've got the lower area down there called Judea, which represented, well, the Dead Sea is down there, which is that Dead Sea. It's a stagnant pool. It's actually the lowest place on earth. And the the Jordan River represents the spine or the spinal fluid. If you follow the Jordan River up, you go to the highest place up there in the north up in Galilee where Elijah set up the school of the prophets a place called Mount Carmel wasn't very far from there where you know the Bible says and, and all the ancient esoteric wisdom says that the angels came and 
made a pact on Mount Hermon. Jesus went to Mount Hermon um, with his disciples and said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against his kingdom. And he says, um, he would build his kingdom. And upon this rock, he would build his kingdom. Up there in the north. And of course, Jesus came from Galilee. And he came down, but he didn't want to go down in winter. He says, it's like we're at the time of year of the winter solstice. And that would be when the sun goes down at the bottom of the astrological wheel. You know, summertime's warmer. Wintertime's colder, so that's because the sun's going down and it's going further and further and further south. We live up here in the northern hemisphere, so the sun's further away from us, so it's colder. And it goes down to the Tropic of Capricorn. You know, that's at the bottom of the wheel. That's that goat-headed god that, you know, rules down there on his big old mountain. Because there's a mountain. There's a peak. You know, the sun goes down, 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 down for three days and three nights, right? There's three houses from Libra, Scorpio, and Sagittarius. And then starts Capricorn. And that's the birth of Saturnalius. And that's what uh, the, the holiday that, that a lot of you are celebrating is, is the, the birth of Saturnalius. Now, we've talked about um, this in a lot of our, our videos, Saturnalius. That's um, Saturn, and that would be the furthest planet out that you can see with the visible eye, or with a telescope or something, with a visible eye. They didn't know anybody about the planets beyond, you know, Pluto and Uranus and all that. So, Saturn was this god that ruled the, the, the darkness down there at the bottom of the wheel in winter. That's where we get Santa Claus, Satan. Saturn. Um, so there's these three houses, and then there's another three houses up to the spring equinox, the vernal equinox. And that's Passover time, and that's when Jesus died and was rose on the third day. What I want to do is talk a little bit about, I want to get all of this in perspective, because there's a whole bunch of stuff we're going to talk about today to explain it's going to explain a lot of things, I think, put a lot of things together because we're we're talking about um, Jewish holidays, what that means, we're talking about weddings, we're talking about the law, we're talking about the holidays, Christmas. Is Christmas in the Bible? Yeah, it is. The Feast of Dedication, it's Hanukkah, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of of these festivals that are kind of conglomerated into one. And all of the ancient kingdoms had these festivals. Easter is the fertility rite of the birth, right? And that's the, the resurrection of Christ. All similar symbolisms, and they're all kind of mished together. But it's all kind of the same thing. And we'll explain why there's two different holidays. You know, you've got sort of the the holidays of, of Judaism and you've got pagan holidays and a lot of there's a lot of confusion today because Christians are saying well we don't want to celebrate pagan holidays when they don't realize that that just means that the holidays of the nations pagan means nation it doesn't mean evil just like the occult doesn't mean evil it means hidden mysteries well Christianity taught the mysteries the hidden wisdom that was you know that the that the angels desired to peer into that was hidden from mankind for thousands of years and was revealed by the apostles and prophets according to uh, his grace. So we're misunderstanding a lot. The reason there's two different ceremonies and festivals and things like that is because there's two covenants. Oh yeah, I know it's going to blow your mind to hear all this, but there are two covenants, as you know. The old covenant is the covenant of that God at the bottom of the wheel, Saturn. He's on his mountain, Sinai, which means uh, in Hebrew, that the letter, the Hebrew letter Shin, means the moon. And so it is the lesser light. Book of Revelation chapter 12 talks about the woman clothed with the sun and the moon is beneath her feet. See, she's conquered that 
other time. You know, those aeons that were down at the bottom of the wheel, the moon, and when it ruled, it's beneath her feet. Now she's up above and she's clothed with the sun. And she has a crown of 12 stars, and that's the zodiac. So, Moses went up to Mount Horeb first. That's the light. But the laws of love, he brought them down, and he shone so bright the people couldn't look upon him. They couldn't understand it, and they didn't want to talk to that God because they couldn't grasp it. They couldn't understand it because he dwells in unapproachable light. And while he was up on the mountain, they went down there and they melted some gold together and threw it in the fire and came out a, a bull, and they began to worship the bull. So when Moses got down from the mountain, he had the laws from Horeb. He had to break them because they were broken. It represented the fact they're broken. And the people said, we want a priesthood instead. We don't want to go in to talk to God. We can't bear it. We don't want the light. So Moses put a veil over his face. And he went back up the mountain. This time he went up the mountain of Sinai, not Horeb. And he got the lesser light. And the lesser law, which is the carnal, the ten manifestations or the sephiroth that, that manifest on the earthly scene. And the beast had ten horns and he came up out of the abyss. That's the bottom of the wheel. Aquarius and Pisces, that's that beast that rules at the bottom of the wheel. And he has seven heads because it's a cyclical kingdom that keeps on going and going. And, he, and he, each head comes up and finally the last head like in a weekly cycle, ends his reign. But it's in a it's a it's a cyclical thing, because at the book of Revelation it says he throws the dragon into the abyss and locks him up for a thousand years. It's a long time, but then at the end of the thousand years he's let loose. So it is a cyclical thing, and it is the the wheel of rebirth. We're going to talk about Christmas. Whether it's a good holiday or a bad holiday, did Jesus celebrate it? Did the apostles celebrate it? And what does it mean? So, the Jewish holidays are the Old Covenant. The Christian holidays are the New Covenant. There is a big difference. They have different holidays. Because, you see, both of these things were a wedding. And this is why, if you go to the book of John, the first chapter, of course, is talking about in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. So that's the very beginning. The second chapter it starts off talking about this wedding, the wedding of Cana. There's so much we're, we can get veer off into the word Cana. <laughs> it has to do with cannabis, but I don't want to get into too many different things. I want to focus on some things here about um, some very important things at this holiday season we need to understand. So, just verses after it mentions this wedding at Cana, it talks about now the feast of the Jews, the Passover feast, was near. Well, what does the wedding have to do with anything? If you go back to the Old Testament, you'll you'll see if you read a lot of, you know, religious stuff from uh, Jewish people, they talk about they made a covenant with God with their God Yahweh and this covenant was like a marriage covenant and they they had some laws they agreed to keep they um, were given certain rights now they would have an heir by virtue of this union then there was Pentecost Pentecost is the day that this God got up on his mountain, and this is Mount. Now, remember, this is the Sinai covenant, the lesser. He gets up on his mountain, and he starts in his wrath. He, he's in thick gloom and darkness, and he's casting thunderbolts and fire down. He said, don't touch my mountain, and I'll kill y'all. He's very angry, and he's wrathful. He speaks with his own voice, the ten words, these ten manifestations that are going to build the edifice that we're living in, our 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 reality. And the people say, this we will do. So death do its part. And if they ever break that covenant, they can be put to death. We're going to find out 
why that has to do with the woman caught in adultery in the book of John. We're really going to be actually studying the book of John today. We've already gone through the first, second, third chapters of John. We're, we're kind of covering it from the beginning towards the end. We're going to understand how this wedding has to do with all of these festivals together. How those festivals, what they have to do with the festivals that we keep as Christians. So there are going to be different festivals because one's an old covenant, one's a new covenant. So Jesus then is talking about this wedding. We can, we can find out from the context of the book of John that it is actually Jesus, his own wedding. Not only from the fact that it's got to be because Jesus is the bridegroom. And if the Bible's symbolic, it's talking about any wedding it's talking about. It's talking about our wedding. See, he changed the water into wine. Why? Because at the wedding you have wine. This is something that if you look at the uh, celebration of the wedding, they always would go and they would meet at the father's house, the father and the, the mother's house. And they would, the, the bridegroom would meet the bride and they would discuss and he would decide and she would decide if they wanted to get married. Now remember, this has nothing to do with the Old Covenant. It's just a tradition or a something that the Jews talk about, this wedding thing. And it really, it's funny, it's odd. Most people have never really thought about this, but the symbolism of the wedding, which is found in the New Testament, is not actually found in the Old Testament. Because the manner in which they got married in the Old Testament is completely different. The only real, you know, we've got the whole pentecost thing where the people told yahweh they would do everything he said he would you know that 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 forms the basis of the covenant that they made the ketubah in hebrew and they signed it well every covenant signed with blood so moses killed the lamb and sprinkled the blood all over the people which represented their firstborn son earlier in the old testament you'll, it talks about how he says I am God and, and y'all belong to me. And I want your firstborn. They're mine. Everything that opens the womb. Not just the animals, but the humans. But because the people didn't really like giving their firstborn son. Remember, Abraham had to give his own son. Well, this God agreed to allow the child to live. Not not in every case. There's many case, cases like Jephthah's daughter and so forth where they did offer up their children. And there's more than just a couple of cases. But... In general practice, he allowed them to give their, their firstborn lamb in place of their son. This is what Passover is all about. The death of the child had to occur. I know, this has to do with why Christ died. Because there is one God that demands the death of your son. <laughs> yeah. Because you, you, you got to keep his laws. He's very harsh. He's the God of vengeance. His name is Jealous. That is his name. He will not pardon your sins to the third and the fourth generation. And he's wrathful and he's angry. And he's the God of jealousy or hate. But see, our Father's the God of love. So there's these two different covenants. So, we're going to explain how each of the you know, there's so many different symbols in the New Testament. Like we've got, so sometimes you're reading about a time of Passover. It's not the time when Jesus actually goes to the cross. But yet there's still symbolisms there. Because this is a cyclical thing. And there are two covenants. So you've got these two different Passovers. John starts off with a Passover and it ends with a Passover. The Passover it ends with is the death of Jesus. But the Passover that it begins with is a completely different thing. It's the, the death of Lazarus. And that's not Jesus, that's us. We died when we entered into the covenant of this angry and wrathful God. So, the first covenant then is a wedding. And the second covenant is a wedding. But the first wedding is much different. In Exodus chapter 21, verse 7, it tells you the law that you would sell your daughter as a slave. Now, you agreed upon certain 
rules. Now in the Old Testament, the rules that they agreed upon is that you will obey him or you will die. And the guarantee that he gave you is that if you keep all of the laws, then I won't kill you. That was your protection. You signed that agreement. You said, God, that God said, I will protect you. I will give you a place to live and, and your, your necessary food and some clothing. There was a, and, and Exodus 21, 7, it, it, it talks about what you were allowed to have. Your child would be an heir to the kingdom. You would be granted a place to live because your son, your firstborn son, would be the heir and you would get through your son would, would have some sort of right to live. You would have clothing. You would have food. They weren't allowed to beat you to death. They could beat you, but not unto death. So you had certain guarantees. That's much different than the next covenant, the other covenant. Because in that one, and the Jews know about this, and, and they talk about it. And they, they relate it to their covenant. But if you look at the differences, there's t completely two different things. Because while the old covenant is demanding you do all these things, and you don't give very much, and you can be put to death, the new covenant is completely different, as you know. Jesus turned the water into wine. And they said, most people save the old wine for last, but you've got the, the best wine now. What, you know, this is great. This new covenant is even better than the old one. This is a completely new wedding. It's not the same wedding. See, the other one says you're going to be killed and murdered. Right after this happens, in chapter 8 of John, it talks about Jesus meeting this woman caught in adultery. Well, see, that's, that's the you know, woman, which is, it's not Jesus' bride yet, because he hasn't repurchased her. But that's us. That's the body. The woman. You see, she had been caught in adultery. Now, this proves that Jesus didn't keep the law of Moses at all and didn't demand that we keep it and didn't want us to keep it. Because the woman didn't just break one of the laws of the Mosaic Covenant. She didn't just like, oh, she had um, broken the Sabbath or, oh, this woman had, she had uh, lied or she did something wrong and, and Jesus said, ah, forgive her. No, 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 no. This woman broke them all. She committed adultery. That's every one of them. Because the entire law covenant was the covenant that she was bound to her husband. For a woman is bound by the law of her husband until she dies, according to the Bible. So they caught her in adultery. She abandoned Yahweh and his religious covenant. Abandoned the God. You know, literally walked away and was found with another man. That's a different covenant, although they may not have committed, you know, themselves to a covenant like that, doesn't say. But this woman was no longer with Yahweh. She had broke the whole covenant. She, under the law, deserved to be stoned to death. Jesus was not only saying, don't, don't stone the woman, which is basically saying, don't keep the law of Moses. But he was saying much more than that. He was saying that entire covenant isn't even binding on you. If you were to just leave and walk away from the entire, in other words, say, I don't believe you're my husband anymore, Yahweh. You don't have any authority over me, Yahweh. And this is more than just, oh, well, I, yeah, I, he is my husband, but I broke one law. Okay, I can be forgiven. No, that's not what he's saying. Jesus is saying to the woman, woman, you're free. That's not your husband. You know, a, uh, he sees a woman at the well and she said she had five husbands. Well, he tells her that. And he says, the, the man you're with now is not your husband. See, the five husbands is the five books of Torah. And Jesus is saying, look, you know, you've gone and you've, you know, because nobody liked the Samaritans. They weren't worshiping Yahweh right. See, they didn't, they, they'd gone and found another mountain to worship. It was a different covenant, a different belief system and jesus didn't condemn her he said you had the law of moses one time perhaps and you're not 
you're, you're not married to them anymore. You've left and you've got another man. He's not even your husband. You're just with some other guy. And they like, how are you talking to this Samaritan woman? She's a woman. It's forbidden in the law of Moses for you to talk to this woman. She's a Samaritan. She's unclean. She's a woman. You're not supposed to talk to women. Jesus never kept any of these laws. And he didn't, can, he didn't ask anyone else to keep any of these laws. So the wedding, chapter 2 of John, is sort of introducing us to the whole story, the whole picture. Because the wedding didn't just, it wasn't just something, it was just like one feast that happened, it was over with. The wedding is the whole thing. There's a whole long period of time where the woman's waiting for her bride. Look, go back to the Old Testament. You'll see where on Passover, they left Egypt. All right, they come up out of Egypt. They passed over. And then they, they, they go for a month or so through the desert. And 50 days later on Pentecost, around June 1st, would be the time of year. That's when Moses gets up on his mountain and these judgments come raining down and all this, it was signed, the marriage was signed. In other words, it was signed with blood, it was agreed to, all the rules and the commandments were given. But that's not the end of the wedding. That's Pentecost. Now in the New Testament, we get the gifts and stuff and and that's part of the, you know, remember, on Passover, Jesus Christ sat there and had a meal. First, they went into the upper room. They made the agreement. He, you know, he came down off the Mount of Olives. He said, this is my law. He didn't say, you know, until death do us part or anything like that. He just said, love one another, forgive one another. It was his law. It was a completely different covenant. He had wine with them. Now, in the wedding parable that they talk about, when they go to the meet with the parents and 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 uh, make the agreement, well, they have wine. They always have wine. They bring out the wine, and they, they, they. Um, this is just part of the the ritual. So when Jesus is drinking the wine, they understood what he was doing when he said, "I will not drink of this wine anymore with you until the day I drink with you." See, as my bride in my Father's kingdom. My father's kingdom, my father's kingdom, not your God, who is the devil. And they understood what that meant because you look it up in any Jewish interpretive book that talks about the weddings that symbolizes their entire religion. And they will tell you that they always had this wine and they made these agreements. And the groom always said, I'm going to go away on a long journey. I'm not going to drink this wine with you anymore. I'm not going to have this festival, this feast with you. We're not going to be together. I go on a, a long trip and I'll return. Now, how does the woman know he's going to return? Well, because he's already signed a contract. He's already paid a price. He's purchased her. And... So he, 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 it's more like a ransom, basically, because if, you know, the money is paid to the parents, he can't get that money back. He, he is so more like a ransom. So you, you're under a contract to come back. That's how the woman knows you're going to come back because you're going to be gone for a long time. He's got to go and prepare a place for his bride. Hence, Jesus told his disciples, I go to prepare a place for thee. And hence, the last of the festivals is the festival of tabernacles. And there were many tabernacles that were made during that time that we came and tabernacled. And that was also called the Feast of Trumpets. And at the last trumpet, you see, we're going to be changed and we're going to be with him. Because those tabernacles that he goes his way to prepare were really uh, places that aren't even on this earth because he says, I go my way to prepare in my father's house. That's in heaven. It's at the top of the wheel. The Feast of Tabernacles in uh, the fall. So at the end of that period of time at the top of the wheel, that's where these tabernacles are. So all of this book of John talking about Jesus going and having a, a wedding and then it says there's a Passover 
and then it says there's a feast of uh, tabernacles. John chapter 7, it says it was the feast of tabernacles. And the disciples came up to Jesus and they said, Jesus, uh, why don't you go down to Jerusalem and show yourself? Because nobody does things like you're doing in secret. If you want to man manifest yourself and make yourself known, you wouldn't do it in secret. So go down there. Leave here and go down there. Jesus is up in Galilee. See, because he says, my time hasn't yet come. What is he talking about? Well, remember, we're all with the Father in the light. And then we have to go down to this dark journey. As soon as the child was born, it says they went down into Egypt. It's always that same pattern, whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament. They go down to Egypt. That is the three houses of Libra, Scorpio, and Sagittarius down at the bottom of the wheel. And that's going down. Right? It's The Tropic of Cancer is summer. That's above. The Tropic of Capricorn is winter. That's below. It's always that way. This is, It's a fixed wheel. The top of the wheel. I don't know why sometimes you'll go and you'll see astrology and it's backwards. And I don't know why they do that because it's always, always the top of the wheel is summer. Because that's where the light is in the above. To above. My father is above. Your father is beneath. He's talking about the bottom of the wheel. Capricorn. Saturn. Yahweh. On his mountain, which is the lesser law. The lesser mountain. Sinai. The old covenant. The carnal. But his father's from above. Light. Love. They said, go ahead and manifest yourself and go down there. And he said, well, it's not my time. But he says, now in the English translations, it says, but it's always your time. What he, and, and, and actually in the Greek, it says it's always prepared. It's prepared for you. So you're always welcome to go and, and, and enjoy it. Because you see, what it's talking about is this physical carnal world. The old covenant. See, Jesus is the Christ. But he says, it's not my time. If you read throughout there, you'll see that they didn't recognize him or, or they didn't see him. He's talking about things that was done in secret. Because even so, though he says it wasn't his time, later on, it says he went up in secret. And he ends up going into the temple. And there he's preaching from the temple. But when they went to the temple, they didn't um, understand him. And he kept saying he was God. And they wanted to stone him for blasphemy. They couldn't grasp it because the flesh or the old covenant can't grasp the new covenant. The fleshly ego cannot grasp or understand its spiritual nature, their inner spiritual man within them. They didn't recognize Christ. They rejected him because it says right there in chapter seven of John, it says that his own brothers did not yet believe in him. Remember, Peter denied him three times and Thomas said, I won't believe unless I put my hand on his side. They still hadn't believed in him. Why? Because they were down in that lower area in Judea. He says, I'm not going to go down there. That's the winter. That's the bottom of the wheel. That's Moses. That's the old covenant. And what covenant was that? Well, that's the Feast of Dedication. John chapter 10. It says it was the Feast of the Dedication and it was winter time. And he went up there and he preached in the temple. He's preaching inside this temple, this carnal flesh. He's, he's trying to speak, he's, he, but it's all illusions. It's parables. We don't get it. We can't understand God. We don't under, we, we know, we, it's all a bunch of ceremonies that we don't understand. It's a bunch of illusions. Life is hard to understand. Rituals and, and carnal laws and do this and do that or you're going to die. It's very harsh. The God that rules down here is very harsh. It's death. It's a curse. It's a bondage. It's the old covenant. And you're bound. You see, you're, you're, the Feast of Tabernacles is the tabernacle that Moses built. And you're in it. But that's not the, the tabernacle that Jesus went to prepare for you. Because that's a new covenant. This whole wedding is a period of time from Passover all the way to Pentecost. All the way along, you see, to the tabernacles and the Feast of Dedication in the middle of winter and then back around to Passover again. 
So we come up out of Egypt. We make an agreement at Passover. We drink the wine. He says, I'm going on a journey. I won't drink this wine with you until I drink it with you in my father's kingdom. He gives us his laws, the laws of love. He goes his way. On Pentecost, he gives us the gifts and goes his way. And we're waiting him, like waiting for him, like 10 virgins waiting for the bridegroom. So there's the, the two months of two or three months of summertime. You know, Pentecost is like the first of June. So you got June, July, and August of this hot summer period. We're waiting for the Lord. And finally, in September, the fall equinox period, the autumn, opt, autumnal, the autumn equinox comes on about September the 23rd, September 21st, somewhere around in there. That's the Feast of Tabernacles. And that ends the great wedding when we go in with him to his tabernacle. So it's the whole 12 months out of the year is this whole wedding. This is the whole process. It's the whole, all of the celebrations is about the wedding. That's why John chapter 2 starts with there's a wedding in Cana. And then immediately after it says the feast of Passover was near. We start with Passover, the beginning of spring, and we go all the way around to Passover again. That's why there's, in the book of John, you've got two Passovers because there's the Old Covenant and there's the New Covenant. Now, the first one, he says, I'm not going to the Festival of Tabernacles. They're all celebrating. Oh, yay, our marriage to Yahweh. Right? And they got this temple and they're dedicating it later on in the Winter Festival. We'll talk about that. But back here in the Tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles, he 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 says... um. I'm not going up. It's not my time because this covenant is not my covenant. And he says, right there in that chapter, he condemned not only their God, you know, John 8 is where he says, your father's the devil. And my father's above and your father's beneath. But he also says, your kingdom is wicked. He condemned it as wickedness. The whole system is I'm not going down there. You don't understand me. You don't know who I am. You've never seen my father. You heard your father. You got your covenant. His 10 words. You heard it from the mountain. But you've never heard my father. Because I'm about to make a new covenant. And I am the word. I am speaking the covenant. And, and, and he, at the Mount of Olives, he gave us his commandments. There was no death involved, no condemnation, no judgment. And he repurchased us. So, the Feast of Dedication is Christmas time. And he gets there and they still don't know who he is. Because they're still under this old covenant and they're dedicating and celebrating a system and they're giving gifts and stuff but it's all this old covenant and this material gifts and in these it's all bondage and, and a curse and a judgment everything and we're still in the end all we're going to get out of this old covenant read exodus 21 7 is we're going to get food and clothing get our wages and our stipends and if we break in one offense, we're bound by the law of our husband until we die. And we will not go out free, as do the other servants, as do the Hebrew servants who were allowed to work off their debt and become free. But it says, when a man sells his daughter as a slave, that, that covenant can never be broken. If you break it, you get to be put to death. So the whole book of John is Jesus saying, I'm not going down to that covenant. It's not my time, but it's prepared. You're always welcome to go. You can live in the world, this old covenant, you can go down there. But you don't know me. You don't know where I'm from and you don't know my father. See, we've got Yahweh, but we don't know his father. 
You know Yahweh. You know his laws. You can go into his temple. You can dedicate his temple. You can celebrate and give gifts to one another. But Jesus says he's not going to go and celebrate. He's not going to celebrate Christmas because Christmas is the a covenant at the bottom of the wheel celebrating Saturnalia. So Passover came along and he sat down and he made a new covenant. He wasn't verifying the old covenant when he when he had Passover. It was just the 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 Lord's Supper. It wasn't that old Passover. It was the Lord's Supper. And he drank the wine with him. And he says, I will drink it no more with you. I'm going to go away. Prepare a place for thee. And Pentecost came. He gave them the gifts. That was the same as the day of Pentecost in the Old Testament where Yahweh made all these commands upon them upon the mountain. And then they went into the wilderness for this long journey. Well, Christ went off on this long journey, said he would return. And we're all waiting for him. So that's what John is talking about. Well, is this, does this festival in the middle of winter, does it have anything to do with Jesus really at all? No, it doesn't. In fact, Jesus said so. He says, this is not my time. I'm not going up to the Feast of Dedication, which is what they call Christmas at that time. He says, it's a place of darkness. It's a time of winter. I'm not going to celebrate then. He says, it's not my time. You know, I'm, I'm on the run here. You know, they're chasing me down. I'm doing a little suffering here. <laughs> not going to celebrate the suffering, guys. Oh, oh, no. He says, my time is coming. Come in springtime, oh, oh, oh. and then I'm going to enter into Jerusalem, and I'm going to tell them what's what, right? The light shall shine down even all the way into the pits of hell. And he went down there, and he rebuked them, and he condemned them. And he said, your father's the devil. Straight out, right to their face. Then he told them something else. He says, you know how your your law says that there's only this one God and you got to worship him? Well, he says, you know, pooey on that because he says, I and the Father in heaven, your, your father's a devil, but my father is the true God. And he and I are one. And they picked up stones. And he disappeared from their, from the crowd. They couldn't find him. They were looking for him. <laughs> they were looking for him. But he, he, he found his disciples. He says, you people, listen to me. Ye are gods. The scripture cannot be broken. It says in your scripture that ye are gods. And I've come to give you life. And that more abundantly. You must seek for me that you might find me. I'm not far from any one of you. But no, I'm not going down into the lower realms, into the night, into the winter. I'm not going to celebrate this feast of dedication where they dedicate this carnal, wicked house. This carnal house. The house of uh, Capricorn ruled over by the goat god. Which is, you know, Saturnalia, the birth of Saturnalia. December 25th is the winter solstice. It's not the celebration of the sun because right now the sun is at the lowest point. The sun is in hell. And why would the sun be in hell? Well, read Isaiah chapter 12. It says, down to hell you will be brought, O Lucifer, you shining bright sun. Sun of the morning. You who say you're God. You're a blasphemer. And in Isaiah 53, it says that 
that dark and evil God who ruled down there, he he um, he enjoyed he enjoyed crushing him in hell. So the suffering that we see in the world is not meant to be, shouldn't be. Jesus condemned it. And he said, happy are those who are peacemakers. He didn't want people to go to war. He refused to keep the Sabbath. Him and his disciples were picking up, were picking grain on the Sabbath. The Testament would put you to death. Yeah, that offense would put you to death, according to the Old Testament. But Jesus said, my father keeps working until now and I keep working. So, you know, I, I'm i talking about this because of two things. This is the time of year that we call Christ Mass. But it's really about St. Nick and the the sect of the Nicolaitans that the book of Revelation says is um, something we don't want anything to do with. Those who are going up to the Feast of Dedication, you know, and they're, they're celebrating the dedication of the lower house, of their sexual orientations and their degradations. They're celebrating this world with all of their presence and, you know, their foolish, selfish, material things. They're celebrating material things. Because that's all it is down there in the darkness. It's all about the material part of the world. We don't celebrate that. You know, we're on the run. We're trying to build a cabin. We're trying to get through it. We're trying to survive. Because we know they're persecuting us. We know we don't belong here. We're no part of this world. The night is far spent, guys. The day is at hand. Go forward as children of light, not children of the darkness, children of night. But look what love the Father hath that we should be called the children of God. The children of the living God. Not the God on his mountain with the thick gloom and darkness and his judgment. Because Jesus said, you have one that condemns you and that is Moses. But I, I've come to give you life and that more abundantly. I do not condemn you. My Father is love. There is no wrath he is light there is no darkness in him he does not tempt anyone with evil nor he can he be tempted with evil but he loves you if you ask me i will ask the father for you anything you ask me i shall ask the father and he shall he shall grant your wishes but i want you to understand jesus said the father loves you himself you don't even you can ask him yourself and he will hear you because he loves everybody. And he's not willing that any should perish. But you're being deceived. He says, you need to come and follow me. I am the Christ within you. Recognize me within yourself. Open your eyes. And they ate the bread. They broke the five loaves of bread. And he gave them some honey, which is the not the honey of a bee, but it's the sweet resin of the cannabis. And he anointed them with the holy anointing oil upon their crown chakra. And their inner spiritual eye was opened and they saw that inner Christ. And he said, now come and follow me. And many of them said, Lord, I want to follow you. You know, this sounds good and I want a spiritual life and I want to, I want to know you. But first... My father has just died. I need to go bury my father. You know, I've got business to do in town. Let me go and tidy up, sell my house, you know, because um, it's worth a lot of money. I got to prepare uh, the finances and I got to go to work and I got to pay my taxes and I got, you know, a lot of things to do. The car needs an oil change. I can't go today. I got too much on my mind. I'll think about it tomorrow when I get old. When I retire, I'll start meditating and praying and 
and I'll find you, Christ. And Jesus said, it'll probably be too late. He gave him a parable. He says, there's ten virgins that went out to meet the bridegroom. And friends, the bridegroom is that inner spiritual man within you that's wanting to come out to the wedding of the flesh and the spirit. It wants the union. You know, Adam and Eve were separated by that, that angry deity. And he drove them out of the garden in his wrath. And he separated them. And we've all been trying to get back together to the, to the wedding you know that the man and the woman should be one flesh it's a very big symbol and and the apostle paul says i speak of christ in his church talking about christ in his body we are the body of christ and so that inner spiritual man needs to become awake you need to find him you know but um, you can't do it at this sometime at the end of your life after you've retired or, you know, or on weekends or only on Sundays or holidays or only on Christmas, right? When you have to celebrate and all this material stuff. It's all about presents and material things. So 10, ten virgins, you know, dedicated to the their, their, their true husband, which is that spiritual Christ, right? And they're waiting for their... No, they're they're faithful and they're waiting and they're they're going to be pure. They don't want to have any illicit intercourse with the material world. They're virgins for Christ. But you know, the night comes and um they get lured away down there to the feast of dedication. Jesus said, No, I'm not going to the feast of dedication, it's not my time. Don't don't get lured away. Because, you know, it's dark and you need a lamp. You need your lamp shining. And you got to have oil to make your lamp shine. And that oil is that holy truth that comes down and lights the candle within. You know, because remember, Christ is inside the holy place, trimming the wicks and lighting the candles. There's seven candles, seven chakras inside your body. And Christ will keep it burning and trim the wicks and keep everything going but you got to have oil you got to have this truth you got to have enlightenment you got to have the holy spirit you don't get it down there in the dark down there in the, the lower part of the temple right the lower half of canaan was the the southern part the dead sea and the the bottom of the of the you know the bottom of the whole picture you don't go down there Christ is from Galilee. You only go down there to bear your witness and testify. And when you go down there, they're going to kill you. They're going to crucify you. But you go willingly at the appropriate time because you're going to be raised up. You're going to bear your cross. You're going to withstand it, but you're not going to be conquered by it. You're not going to revel in it. You're not going to celebrate it. You got to have some oil in your lamps. And five of the virgins had oil and five did not. Don't be a foolish virgin, friends. Don't be, don't be silly. Don't, don't lose the opportunity to get out of this nasty wheel of rebirth. Because there's nothing good down here. This is not my kingdom. It's never been part of my kingdom. This is not my kingdom. Be no part of the world. Get out of her, my people, if you do not want to share with her in her sins. Because she is laden down and burdened with this great judgment and error. Because Jesus, you will not get out. You go down there, you will not go get out unless you've paid the uttermost penny. The last little farthing. You got to pay the price. And when Jesus died, Judas took the 30 pieces of silver and he put it into the, that he, he was paid for his betrayal. And they threw it into the money, into the, into the treasury. That was the price of a slave. You were redeemed. You were purchased. 
Now come and follow me and let the dead go bury their dead. So anyway, friends, I'm going to leave it there. I hope you guys have a really great day. It's David Vos. We'll see you again tomorrow. Have a good one.